The basic design of lifts has changed little in the last 80 years and it's been realised they're an extraordinarily safe form of transport. It's actually statistically safer travelling by lift than climbing the stairs. This lift is supported by seven ropes sharing the weight and each one of them is capable of carrying the whole lift by itself. Even if they did all break, there's yet another safety device called the governor. If this rotates just 10% too fast, this disc starts to come out and catches this switch, turning off all the electrics. If it goes slightly faster still, this uh, whole disc locks up completely. This pulls in wedges under the car, jamming it against the guide rails. The modern equivalent of Otis's safety. This is the lift motor. It's connected via a brake and a gearbox to the pulley drum and the cables. If all the electric fails, it's still just about possible to move the lift by hand. So it's always possible to haul any passengers trapped inside to safety. This is the Express Lift Company in Northampton, and this tower is where they test their lifts. As buildings got higher, there was a demand for lifts to travel faster. This motor powers a high-speed lift that travels the whole height of the tower. Speeding up a lift is quite simple. The motor is just connected directly to the pulleys without any gears in between to slow it down. High-speed lifts were first used on the Woolworth building in 1913, and they've changed very little ever since. The only limitation on speed is comfort, which depends mainly on the car's acceleration. If I stand on some weighing scales as I go down, my normal weight's about 10 stone, my apparent weight should drop. Yeah, there it goes, for instant dieting. If the acceleration was any greater, I would feel I'd left my stomach behind. And then when it stops accelerating, my weight goes back to normal. And uh, finally, when we get to the bottom and it decelerates, my apparent weight should increase, sort of literally weighing me down. Yeah, there it goes. Different countries tolerate different accelerations, Japan the least and Australia the most. About 10 stories is considered the maximum practical distance for a lift to accelerate, and this effectively determines the maximum practical speed, about 20 foot per second in this case. Although the mechanical design of lifts has changed little in the last 80 years, they did used to look rather different. Like most lifts of the 20s, this had no separate shaft. It uh, was built into an existing stairwell, all protected by this decorative steel mesh. This lift would originally have been worked by a full-time operator. The biggest change in lifts since the 20s has been to automate the control gear, removing the need for an operator. This has been partly modernised now, but uh, originally both doors would have had been shut by hand. Without an operator, it was easy to forget to close the doors when you left the lift, and then the caretaker would have to climb up and shut them before the lift would work again. Then there was just a single control for up and down, and needed some skill to stop the lift in exactly the right place. New York was reduced to chaos in 1937 when the operators went on strike. 2,000 office buildings are affected. A million and a half New Yorkers are grounded. The strikers object to a raised hourly pay rate, but a reduced work week. Result, less take-home pay. A few inventive geniuses find ways to have business almost as usual. But for the most perpendicular city in the world, an elevator strike is no laughing matter. How would you like to walk up? from way down there. The key to automation was really the sensors. Some are simple switches. This is a giant model of a micro switch. It just switches these contacts on and off. 
This is their actual size. This one's being used to stop the lift car from hitting the top. Some sensors work without touching anything. These were originally magic eye beams that switch whenever the beam was broken. But today you don't usually see these because they work with infrared. This is a modern sensor. The light comes out of one side and is picked up on the other side. So when it's pointed at a mirror, it switches just as before when the beam is interrupted. Well, sensors like this are amazingly versatile. I used one last year to detect the difference between the head of a coin and the tail. I simply polished the head so it reflected the beam, but I didn't polish the tail. There are three separate sensors on the doors. There's a beam across them. There's a touch sensitive strip all down the edges. And uh, then there's an extra sensor that checks if nothing gets squashed too hard in the middle. The uh, doors are actually worked by a motor that sits on top of the car in there. I open this up. Take off the lock, you can see the doors, the motor move. And then there are extra sensors to confirm whether it's open or closed. Finally, there are sensors to detect the position of the lift fixed to the top of the car. The infrared beams are interrupted by these metal plates, one set for each floor to stop the car at the right place. All these switches and sensors are connected to the motor room by wires dangling under the car. The control gear has become extremely sophisticated. There are several microprocessors in here using the information from the sensors to control the lift motor. The control gear not only has to respond to all the switches and sensors in the car, but it also has to manage where the lifts go. This is a control simulator at Express Lifts, uh, and it's currently being used to test the program to work out the best way for a group of four lifts to answer a number of different calls. So if, for instance, I set a call from the 12th floor, I think, oh, this lift's going to answer it, the third lift. So it's come down to the 12th floor, then I think the doors should open. So then, say, the person who's got into that lift wants to go to the seventh floor. Um, this, the doors should close again, and uh, the lift should start going down. Well, um, if these lifts receive a whole lot of calls together, then uh, the number of different possible combinations for, for the lifts to answer all these calls quickly grows to uh, hundreds and thousands. It's the microprocessor that decides the most efficient way to answer them all.